All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today in the Office of Vocational and Adult Education at the U.S. Department of Education for this third event in our 2013 Community College Webinar Series. My name is Mary Alice McCarthy, and I work here in OVA in the Policy Office, and I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to moderate today's event. The next 90 minutes are sure to be very engaging. We have, a, we have community college and career pathway experts from across a broad array of different organizations, um, including a philanthropic foundation, a state community and technical college system, and two community colleges. Before we jump into the content, though, I just want to quickly go over some of the technical specifications. You should be seeing an introductory slide on the left side of your screen with the Department of Education's logo in the bottom right-hand corner. If you aren't seeing this slide, please make sure the correct display tab is open. It should be the one titled OVA Webinar and be at the top of your screen. If you're having any trouble with the display and you have another web browser on your system, you might want to try switching over to a different browser. So this webinar is meant to be heard over your computer speakers or with a headphones. But for those of you who would prefer to join um, a teleconference line, please send an email to the following address, questionsforove at ed.gov. And that's questions for O-V-A-E, all is one word, at ed.gov. We'll then provide you with the call-in number and passcode so you can listen to today's event using, using a teleconference line. Please note that there's also a short video during today's event. The audio for this video will be provided only through computer speakers. So if you are listening to the event using a teleconference line, you're not going to be able to hear the audio during this two-minute video. We apologize for this inconvenience, but uh, please do know that the entire recorded webinar will be archived on OVE's website in the coming days. So you'll be able to watch the full webinar with the video as soon as it's posted if you can't see it today. If you experience any other technical problems while participating in the webinar, please send a short message describing your challenge to David Preve here in OVE. His email address is david.preve at ed.gov, and that's david, D-A-V-I-D, dot Preve, P-R-E-V-E, at ed.gov, and we'll attempt to help you solve it as quickly as possible. Because of the large number of people we have online with us today, we will be taking questions electronically throughout the session. We built in some time for Q&A following the moderated discussion with our panelists. To ask a question of our presenters, please type in the bottom of the Q&A box and then click Send to All Panelists. We'd like, to be, we'd like this to be an open and engaging event, so feel free Feel free to enter your questions and respond to your colleagues from around the country using this WebEx chat feature throughout the event. You don't need to wait till the end. In fact, we'd love to have your questions as we go along. All right, well, I think we're ready to go then. Thank you so much for taking part in the event today, which will focus on the central role of community colleges in developing career pathways programs and systems. It's my pleasure now to introduce my boss, Dr. Brenda Dan Messier, the Assistant Secretary of the Office of Vocational and Adult Education, who is going to provide some opening comments. Thank you very much, Mary Alice, for moderating today's event. On behalf of Secretary Duncan, Under Secretary Martha Cantor, and the entire Department of Education, I want to welcome you and thank each of you for joining us today for the third webinar in OVA's 2013 Community College Webinar Series. We're thrilled to have this ongoing opportunity to engage with community colleges across the country and highlight the many important contributions they make to their local communities and regions they serve. Before I begin, I want to take a moment to thank our partners on this webinar series, the American Association of Community Colleges and the Association of Community College Trustees for their valuable input in developing today's event and our entire community college webinar series. Their feedback and perspective has been tremendously helpful as we've planned, developed, and promoted these webinars. Most importantly, I want to thank our audience for your interest and engagement on these critical issues and for all the tremendous work you're doing on the ground to expand educational opportunities for our students. I don't have to tell all of you on the call today how valuable community colleges are and the many critical missions they fulfill. What you may not know is that the Obama administration believes community colleges are the un sung heroes of the higher education system, and the administration knows that community colleges will play a huge role in achieving the President's 2020 college completion goal and meeting our country's pressing need 
for a skilled workforce. As Mary Alice said, this webinar will focus on the pivotal role community colleges play in career pathways systems. Now, the signature characteristic of a career pathway strategy is that it aligns and integrates the delivery of employment, education, and support services in ways that support student and worker success. There's a growing recognition that comprehensive approaches to employment and education services that focus on supporting transitions between school and work, that provide supportive and wraparound services, and are closely aligned with the needs of local employers simply work better and achieve improved outcomes for our students. While we, re we re recently received good news, the national unemployment rate fell to a four-year low of 7.5%, we know that figure is significantly higher for youth and low-skilled adults. So while our economic recovery appears to be slowly picking up steam, we cannot afford to be complacent. And we know that we need to find faster and more efficient ways of preparing youth and low-skilled adults to succeed in a, an economy that demands higher-level skills. We also know that oftentimes our federal education and workforce training programs are overlapping and often serve the same populations with very little coordination. So all of us need to be thinking about strategies to better serve these populations and eliminate redundancies. In April 2012, the Departments of Education, Labor, and Health and Human Services, the three federal agencies primarily responsible for administering the big federal funding streams that support education and training issued a joint commitment to promote the use of career pathways approaches as a promising strategy to help adults acquire marketable skills and industry-recognized credentials through better alignment of education, training and employment, and human and social services among public agencies and with employers. Now, I've only been in D.C. for about four years but I've been working here long enough to know that a joint communication from three different federal agencies all agreeing to unify around common definitions and goals is a huge accomplishment. What's more, our three agencies have continued this collaboration, forming an interagency career pathways working group to support each other's initiatives and advance this critical yet challenging work. I want to publicly thank all of the staff, members at each of the agencies who work so hard to get this letter published and who serve on the interagency working group. Many of you are aware that we held an interagency national dialogue on career pathways last October in collaboration with the National Governors Association. That was a fantastic event that brought together representatives from foundations, state, community, and technical college systems K-12 through school districts, community colleges, four-year universities, community-based organizations, workforce development boards, and the federal government to highlight and deepen federal and state commitments to the development of comprehensive career pathway systems and to identify strategies for scaling and coordinating these efforts. Today's webinar is meant to continue and deepen many of the discussions we began at the National Dialogue and to highlight the really central role of community colleges in integrated career pathways systems. In fact, two of our distinguished panelists today, Dr. Jay Box, Chancellor of the Kentucky Community and Technical College System, and Whitney Smith, Director of Employment Programs at the Joyce Foundation, took part in the National Dialogue. Today, we'll also highlight two community colleges doing great and innovative work to build specialized on-ramps to post-secondary education and training, both for youth and returning adults in their regions. Deborah Davidson, Vice President of the Workforce and Economic Development Division at Gateway Technical College, and Guadalupe Chavez, Director for High School Programs at South Texas College, are here to discuss what their career pathways programs look like at the local level. I'm very excited to hear from all of our panelists on this webinar, and I want to thank them in advance for their impressive work and for their participation in today's webinar. I know their diverse perspectives will provide all of us with a lot to think about as we continue this critical work. And with that, I'll turn it back to Mary Alice to kick off our discussion. 
Wonderful. Thank you, Brenda. And um, before moving into the discussion portion of the webinar, I just want to spend a minute on, on, on the question of what we mean when we say career pathways. So sometimes you know, we, we hear these terms and they can be hard to sort of grapple with and you can hear them in one context and they mean one thing and they're referring to one set of strategies and then you hear them in another context and they sound different. So Assistant Secretary Dan Massier talked about the joint letter that the Departments of Education, Labor, and Health and Human Services issued last year that included the definition of career pathways. And that is what is on the slide. Um, what's on this slide is that definition. Um, and believe it or not, that's actually a slightly abbreviated version of the definition. So it's not something that fits on the back of an envelope. But what I want to emphasize about this definition is that what you can see in it is that Career Pathways isn't a strategy aimed at any single population. It's not for high school students or disconnected youth or low-skilled adults or dislocated workers. Rather, it's a set of strategies and services that are designed to help individuals at any stage of their life access and complete the education and training they need to earn the skills and credentials that are in demand by local employers and lead to good jobs at good wages. So that's why Career Pathway programs are programs that are aligned with the needs of local employers that provide on-ramps to all types of education, that are designed around the needs of working learners, that incorporate career counseling, et cetera. I'm not going to go through each of the bullet points. But you can see that it's a comprehensive strategy, and the important thing are the, the components of the strategy, but it can be applied to a, a wide variety of different populations. And today we're going to hear from institutions and organizations that have developed these programs and the policies and partnerships needed to support them. So with that, let's turn to our first very esteemed panelist, Whitney Smith, who is the director of the employment program at the Joyce Foundation. Joyce has been one of the pioneering funders in the area of Career Pathways and has really been instrumental in elevating the profile of Career Pathways as an approach to human capital development and raising the bar around the need for more research and evaluation in this area. So Whitney, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me, Mary Alice, and thank you to all your colleagues at OVA for having me. I, Career Pathways is a topic I'm passionate about. Well, that's great, and so we're, we're happy to have you on with us today. I guess just to get us started, Whitney, could you fill us in on the Joyce Foundation's uh, interest and work in the area of career pathways? Sure, and just for the uh, callers and participants who are unfamiliar with our foundation, just a thumbnail sketch. We're based in Chicago, and we focus on proving the quality of life for people living in the Great Lakes region. And I manage a program we call employment. It's been around for decades. And our goal is simple. We're trying to improve the employment outcomes of underprepared and low-income adult workers in our region. Right now, we have a couple priorities. And I'm not going to speak about our innovation fund. That's for another webinar another time. But our two other priorities um, are relevant to career pathways. We are very much focused on evaluating and scaling approaches for adults that do not have a high school diploma or equivalency um, and help them accelerate onto a college pathway that leads to a credential that's valued in the labor market. And we are also directly working with industry both to build their internal career pipelines but also um, to help them articulate their credential needs um, to educational institutions to make sure that uh, the two, two parties are working together so students can get a credential that will lead to career advancement. We uh, began our interest in career pathways back in 2005, which, was, if you'll recall, was pre-recession. But nevertheless, the region that I sit in was going through a massive economic transformation driven mostly by globalization and technology and manufacturing being our base, changing dramatically. And it was clear to us that um, we needed kind of big, bold thinking from governors and business leaders on what kind of workforce system we needed to prepare workers for not only kind of the new economy, but an ever-changing economy. We had the privilege of doing a deep dive in the region and talking to lots of stakeholders and found what will be very familiar to people on this call, and um, Assistant Secretary Dan Messi already started to speak about it, which is that we had a lot of kind of uncoordinated programs. So they might in, have been in their own right a good program, a GED program or a training program that led to a short-term certificate. 
but they weren't coordinated in a way that if a worker wanted to continue on an educational pathway to lead to career advancement, that it was easy for him or her to do so, and that their um, experience could be articulated or credited as they move forward. And this led to inefficiencies and resources, which none of us can afford in a, uh, afford in a time of constraint. So um, the good news in this deep dive process is we identified a, a number of leaders, uh, both in our region but around the country, who recognized all these issues and were really experimenting with creative approaches, which I later kind of learned were, were considered career pathway approaches. That wasn't even a term familiar to me um, in the day. So that led to a, a kind of a cascade of investments. Um, first, we got a toe in the water by funding an institution that was one of these leading um, uh, leaders thinking through new strategies, Madison Area Technical College, uh, which then um, led to us funding a how-to guide, which featured uh, a Kentucky Community College, and Dr. Box is um, on the call today. I'm thrilled to join him. Um, and, and then we led to what I think is mostly our signature initiative in this space, which is called the Shifting Gears Initiative. And I will speak about this a little bit later on the call, but essentially we worked with top leaders from adult education, workforce development, and of course the community college systems in our six states to um, identify ways to not only kind of align educational programs, but also uh, resources so that we could create kind of a more coherent pathway system that um, workers or students could progress uh, on and of course um, hopefully achieve better employment outcomes. Uh, we do have a number of current investments. I'm not going to go through them all. They're on the screen if you want to see. but. I think the good news here is that now there are so many multi-state initiatives underway that are both um, kind of uh, stimulating this kind of programmatic approach um, and systems approach, but also um, are, many of these have evaluations attached to them. So I think we will in several years have just a much better understanding about what works and what doesn't work and what to look for in terms of a quality career pathways approach. Great. Thanks, Whitney. It's really impressive work that Joyce is doing. Um, just a heads up that we have gotten a few um, questions from the audience asking if you could speak a little bit louder. So I'm just going to put that out there before I send my next question, which is today's webinar is focused specifically on the role of community colleges and career pathways. Can you share with us how you see community colleges fitting into this work with all the work that you've been doing here? What are the opportunities for community colleges and what are the challenges? Yes, and, and thank you. I will try to speak louder. Um, so community colleges are absolutely critical to career pathways, and I've just highlighted three roles that I you know, see as imperative, but there are many more, and you'll hear about them by other speakers on the call. Um, the first is that career pathways is not just a standalone program. It's really an approach. It's an approach to understanding what jobs are available in an industry, and um, what skills are needed, and then bringing the right educational institutions uh, together, or it, sometimes it's you know departments within a college together, um, to figure out how to create a pathway that would supply uh, workers to to these industries, um, and often you know will go on to a four-year uh, university, and so that takes a lot of convening. And community colleges are uniquely positioned to do that work, and that you know there are lots of good examples of that. The second, um, I think, opportunity is just innovation within your own uh, walls. And I've cited like a couple, two, two innovation uh, pathways, but you can, you know, there's no end to the kind of creativity here. One is, um, and this is something I'm passionate about because I'm particularly focused on adults that have kind of limited or lower basic foundational skills. But you can really try to streamline the on-ramps for adult and developmental education students to get into college-level programs through um, contextualized learning um, strategies and integrated training strategies. You also, of course, can take your degree programs and um, chunk them into manageable sequences so that a student who might only be able to uh, 
you know, undertake kind of a certificate level program, then might stop out in the labor market and return and can continue on and end it and finish with a, a degree, an associate's degree. Um, and then the third is um, evaluation. I mentioned there's more of this going on, but the field is relatively nascent, and we are, you know, find it hugely promising career pathway approaches. But to the extent that you can commit upfront to creating some kind of data infrastructure to really understand how students who are going through these approaches, even opposed to or compared to other more traditional programs you have. Um, that would add to our understanding about what's working and what's not working, um, and or you know volunteer to be part of one of these national rigorous evaluations that have uh, increasingly been emerging in the field. Um, so I, I'm very enthusiastic. That doesn't mean <laughs> that there aren't challenges in this space, and and you asked me to speak to that, Mary Alice. So I'll do that briefly. Um, you know, the first is that we've been really excited about these integrated training programs that colleges have been taking on where students who don't necessarily have this high school diploma or um, equivalency could enroll in credit bearing programs and then get help with foundational skills kind of in the context of their occupational training. Unfortunately, um, a congressional decision eliminated federal student aid uh, provision called Ability to Benefit, which many of you probably know about, um, but it limits federal aid to, to students who already have a high school diploma or equivalency. So that's a huge challenge just in terms of scaling up these programs, and the state leaders have been really um, grappling with this and, and making commitments to try to figure out workarounds, but also we need, um, in my view, uh, federal advocacy to try to restore that provision to federal aid. The second challenge is, is data. I mean, um, well, I'm encouraging you to set up data tracking systems. Uh, career pathway programs often involve lots of partners, which means that the data isn't just tracking within your institutions. It's often connecting to employment outcome data, or if adult education sits outside of your institutions, it might be partnering with that system to understand how students are transitioning from one system to the other. And that's just hard on a lot of levels. You often have to have um, data sharing agreements. They can take long. There are privacy um, considerations that you have to be careful about. Um, and yet, you know, it is surmountable, and um, it's really important. It's just not easy. And then the final thing is that everybody who talks about uh, career pathways and, and delivers career pathway approaches just always prioritizes support services, whether they're social services or also you know, career advising and academic advising. Um, but most institutions don't have dedicated funding streams or nearly the funding to meet the need on this. And I think this is just kind of an untapped area we, to, to come up with scalable approaches. There are some really creative um, models. And in fact, again, another shout out to Kentucky with their Ready to Work program. Um, but, you know, and and some other like kind of creative, smaller scale solutions. But I think that, that it is, I just want to recognize that there's not enough funding or a sustainable funding source for that. I'll Great, stop. thanks, but, hmm? oh, I'm sorry. I just said I'll stop there. So. Oh, okay. Oh, good. Great. Well, thanks, and that was great, and a, a, a sort of a wonderful grounding as we as we go on to talk uh, to the community colleges. But uh, we do have one last question for you, which is that the Jewish Foundation has recently completed an evaluation of its Shifting Gears initiative. Can, speaking of of research and evaluation, so can you share with us what the big takeaways um, are from your evaluation and how it's affecting your strategic direction moving forward? Yep. And I feel a little bit like you did in trying to um, summarize, you know, the career pathways definition in a few seconds. This was a labor of love and work with leaders um, in six states for uh, now more than six years. And so I'm going to try to just quickly tick off what I think are kind of what you would consider the success conditions or conditions for success for the states that made the most progress. Um, and just recall, our funding actually went to fund state 
leaders who had cross-agency teams, and in some cases, um, our funding then eventually was used to pilot some approaches at community colleges, but this was really a state policy and systems change effort, and they had to have adult education uh, community colleges and workforce development leaders at minimum at the table, but some states um, then, you know, reached out further. Minnesota, who I believe there are representatives on the call today, reached out to their TANA for Welfare Human Service Agency, et cetera. Um, and the states that really have figured out creative career pathway approaches and scaled them had um, very strong commitment from senior leaders. They understood that really what this was about was um, coming up with a workforce development approach that um, used resources better and also made sure that no workers were left behind. And they really um, stuck with it and often through gubernatorial transitions, which was really impressive. Um, there was always a strong convener of these cross-agency partnerships. You know, meetings don't come together <laughs> without someone who's um, not only doing kind of the logistics, but also keeping people together on uh, the visions, the goals, the activities, and following through. Um, very quickly, the states that made the most progress realized where their big biggest disconnects were, and they came up with kind of a model or an approach that they wanted to test and, and then eventually scale, went on to pass policies to ease the way for that program expansion. Um, and you know, if we have time in Q&A, if someone wants to hear an example of that, I'm happy to provide. Um, used discretionary resources to stimulate kind of interest in the field around these approaches. Um, certainly the Recovery Act money was used in all six of our states to try to kind of uh, get institutions interested in this approach. Um, but then the state leaders regularly were talking to community college and other leaders, um, having, using their existing infrastructure like um, conferences, annual conferences. You know, many states have professional development arms and just uh, that was a two-way conversation at that point about you know, what the state was trying to learn and scale and what institutions were finding challenging um, and opportunities. And then finally, um, you know, it was really the states who really embraced career pathway approaches were just eager for learning. Um, and this is just maybe a principle in general about leadership, but were reaching out to their peers across other states to find out what they were doing and actively speaking in national conferences and talking to people at the federal agencies and kind of creating what I would say has been this community of learning that we've all uh, been part of over the last, you know, eight to ten years that has been the Career Pathways Movement. Great. And I'm Thanks so obviously <laughs> happy to answer uh, any questions or feel free to just contact me outside of this uh, this meeting with any questions you have. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, and, you know, thanks to the George Foundation for all the amazing work they're doing around career pathways. Um, and so now we're going to go, we're going to actually hear from two community colleges that are doing some path-breaking work in providing career pathways to both young people and adults. We're going to start with Mr. Guadalupe Chavez, who is the Director of High School Programs for the South Texas College System, which has its main campus in McAllen, Texas. South Texas has been widely recognized for its excellent work on creating on-ramps to post-secondary education for many first-time college goers and high school dropouts. So Guadalupe, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for having us here. We appreciate it. Great. Well, just to get started, you know, STC or South Texas has been doing an amazing job helping students who might not otherwise consider college not only get into college but earn lots of credits and earn degrees. Can you tell us about South Texas's work with local area high schools around dual enrollment? Yes, definitely. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with uh, South Texas College, we are actually way down south, five hours south of uh, Austin or four hours south of San Antonio. We are a two-county serving school district, and we've opened our doors in 1993. So we're still a young college. Uh, we were created by Texas Senate Bill 251, and we've been serving our area for now 20 years. 
uh, we grew from 10 certificates to over 100 degrees, including three baccalaureate degree programs now, where we have, uh, we grew from one campus to uh, six campuses, where we have now over 30,000 credit bearing students. Um, our service area, we have many first-generation low-income college students. 93% of our students are of Hispanic enrollment, and over 90% of our student enrollment is on some form of uh, financial aid. So, you know, with, with that combination, we wanted to, um, how can we accelerate towards college completion, college preparation? So, uh, we actually work with 21 school districts uh, in our two county serving district area. We have over 68 high schools that we work with. All 68 high schools offer some form of dual enrollment. As you can see from the slide, uh, our dual enrollment is the largest enrollment, the largest dual enrollment in the state of Texas with over 12,200 students. Now that encompasses several programs within dual enrollment, which I'll explain in a little bit. But as you can see from the class sections that we offer, again, this is just dual enrollment, about 41% are career and technology courses that we offer to high school students, uh, either most of them at the, at the school districts and some of them here at one of our campuses. So we work very closely with the uh, high schools to approve faculty. So as you can see, we have over 300 high school dual enrollment faculty that are qualified uh, faculty that are high school teachers. They meet the same credentials as a traditional STC faculty member here. And then we have over 100 STC faculty members from STC that are here on a full-time basis that commute to some of these high schools to offer either academic or career and technology dual enrollment courses. The Programs that encompass the dual enrollment program uh, is one is our traditional dual enrollment program where the students take their classes at the uh, high school. We do have a dual enrollment academy program which started in fall 2005, and this is for uprising juniors and seniors who uh, want to advance or get a two year associate's degree while they are in high school. This is not an open admissions program, this is actually a competitive program. Students apply when they are in 10th grade. Students who get accepted uh, for two years, juniors and seniors, they uh, are enrolled in their high school in the morning from about 7.30 to 12 noon. And then from 1 to 5.30 p.m. in the afternoon, they are full-time college students at our campus where they are working towards a degree either in biology, engineering, computer science, or criminal justice. So that program in itself has a lot of student support systems. Uh, we meet with the students on a weekly basis. We talk to them about a lot of college education, college uh, knowledge workshops, academic workshops, personal workshops. We do campus field trips with them. Uh, we take them on many sites geared towards the STEM area. Uh, one of our goals in that program is to also uh, transition these students to a, to a four-year college. So we work very closely with uh, our neighboring four-year university, which is UT Pan American. Uh, here in Edinburgh, Texas, and uh, they come and do presentations. We work with many uh, different universities as well throughout the state of Texas. The other program that encompasses dual enrollment is the School to Career Academy in dual enrollment, which we refer to this as SCAPE. The SCAPE program, unlike the academies and unlike the traditional dual enrollment, this is for students that are at a non-traditional high school. These are students that are in an op options type high school. They're at-risk students uprising seniors, uh, so what we do is we introduce them into a certificate in welding or a certificate in the health electronics record specialist certificate, and students pretty much go to their option schools, and then they are also attending a certificate either in welding or the uh, health electronics specialist certificate. So there's, there's uh, processes set in place where uh, we transition the students to go beyond just the certificate. So we help the students apply for admissions, financial aid, advisement, you know, registration, so that the students can ha have a seamless transition to STC as well. Uh, the dual enrollment also encompasses our early college high schools. 
We have currently 15 early college high schools that we work with. And as many of you know, you know, they start off with 100 students each. Some of these high schools were already seeing graduates uh, with associate's degrees uh, with some of these early college high schools. So that is a big program in, in itself. And uh, high school programs and services has three uh, outstanding coordinators who manage those 15 early college high schools and ensure that these students are on a career pathway to finish their associate's degrees. The high school recovery program is, a, is another program which I'll be talking to in a minute, so I won't mention much other than this is for students that uh, have uh, reached the end of their senior year, and I'll talk about it more in a little while. And then we have also our McAllen College Career Transitions Initiative Program. This is for students that are, uh, you know, they are still in ninth grade and they only have maybe three credits, four credits, and they're falling behind uh, what we do with these students and we work with them ninth and 10th grade, we bring them up to part through credit recovery and offering them some career and technology courses. And then uh, 11th and 12th grade, then we go ahead and uh, follow them through so that they can get into dual enrollment. So uh, these are some of the programs that, are, that we encompass in our dual enrollment. We have a great partnership with uh, our high schools. Every year we host a principal summit uh, where we invite all the principals from all 68 high schools that we work with uh, and their uh, counselors so that we can talk about best practices, outcomes, uh, what is working, what, what are some of the implications that they're experiencing, and so we can work on those. Uh, we have a great dual enrollment faculty orientation and professional development day for them as well. So there's a lot of support that, that, that the dual enrollment faculty uh, teaching career and technology or academic uh, courses received here through our professional development office, through the Teaching and Learning Academy, uh, where they can partner with another instructor, uh, and just different workshops that we have for them. Along these lines, there's a lot of collaborative work that gets done as well. Um, every year we, we seek out memorandums of understandings uh, with the superintendents and our college president here at SCC, Dr. Reed, uh, that emphasizes uh, the commitment, the commitment uh, of providing dual enrollment at their high schools and waiving tuition and fees, which we'll talk about it in a little while, and then the principal agreements, which is pretty much the expectations that we expect at the high schools for those uh, teachers that are going to go teach at the high schools. And then, of course, we have uh, a dual enrollment manual for all of our faculty uh, teaching uh, at the high schools, teaching dual enrollment, and then finally a one-stop shop process. This one-stop shop, STC actually goes to all the high schools that we serve where we provide admissions processes, financial aid processes, advisement processes, so that those students that are still at the high school, we can transition them uh, over to STC. So we pretty much take a show on the road where we take laptops, we take uh, our specialists, we take our counselors, our advisors, and we go and set up shop in a gym uh, type setting and provide all these services to the students. Great. Thanks, Lupe. That was an excellent overview. And, and I don't know if I heard you say it, so I'm just going to say it again, that, Texas, that, that South Texas does have the highest number of duly enrolled students in the state of Texas. So congratulations on that work. You Thank mentioned you. the... The uh, High School Recovery Program, which is a program uh, directed at, at uh, disconnected youth, uh, youth out, out of school youth. I was wondering if you could give us just some of the, the highlights from that program, just sort of a quick overview. And which was which one uh, again was this? Mary Alice? The high school the high school recovery program for the out of school yeah. youth. Yes, yes, we have um, we have what we call a fifth year senior recovery program. This program is actually to target students who went all the way to 12th grade, but then at the end of 12th grade, they didn't finish high school because either they didn't pass uh, the state mandated exam, which to us is the Texas Assessment of College of Knowledge and Skills exam, which is the tax, or the students are missing credits. So what we were finding out is that these students were not coming back the following year to complete their high school. So what we started doing is we started working uh, through uh, the school districts that we have. We have about eight, eight or nine school districts that are now participating in this. Uh, we, set, we sat down and we discussed, well, how can we get these students to come back? 
You know, so uh, what we did is we started targeting, and the, along with the school districts, uh, students up to the age of 26, because school districts can actually collect average daily attendance funding for students up to the age of 26 at the high school level. So what we said is, okay, so you didn't finish high school, come join us in college. So uh, the purpose of this is to, first of all, ensure that students get a high school diploma, but at the second time, to funnel them in into post-secondary education. So pretty much what this program is, is uh, in a semester, let's say we have a student who did not graduate high school. Come fall semester, uh, what we do from September to through mid-October, we offer these students a uh, course either in credit recovery or in tax tutorials. And then the second half of the semester, which is the middle half of October through December, we put we register these students into a career in technology mini master college class. So now the student is not missing out. So anywhere in between, uh, we have processes so that we can transition these students over to our college at the beginning of the spring semester. So there is a recruitment process for this. You know, uh, high schools are the ones that reach out to these students. They run their reports, who has not graduated, who still have, is in within that age limit, and believe it or not, you know, some of the schools, they've gone as far as visiting the students' houses and bringing them over to the campuses where the, these recovery school sites are located. Once the student applies, then the students take a career interest assessment, okay? And this is to determine, you know, what are the interests that the students want so that we can, in turn, SCC, offer the career and technology courses that the students need. So the career, the courses are made available on career interests. You know, one of the things that we want, that we take into consideration is we want for a lot of engagement uh, in these classes. So we try to uh, have as many courses that are that have a lot of kinesthetic learning in it, and uh, versus just the traditional classroom setting. Uh, the classes are very flexible. Okay, we offer them either in the mornings or in the afternoons. And the classes that we offer are stackable uh, career pathway credentials. You know, it's contextualized learning. Uh, students who complete the, the, the graduate high school and complete the mini master, they move on, you know, and transition to SCC. Those students who still do not pass their, their tax or finish their credit recovery will offer another class to those students as well. So it's a very, uh, we've seen a lot of success uh, we've we've graduated uh, from high school uh, over close to 3,000 students in this recovery program, and we have seen a lot of success rate in these programs as well. We've had about a 79 to 80 percent of the students who register into a mini master actually get a passing grade. So that has been very very successful. That, it is really impressive and uh, just, again, shows that career pathways can work for all sorts of different populations. It's really about the services and putting them together in the right way. Lupe, we've got one last question for you today, which is, which is about funding. We know that one of the big challenges when it comes to dual enrollment programs is figuring out how to pay for it. Um, can you share with us how South Texas can waive all that tuition for dually enrolled students and still make ends meet? Definitely. Uh Back in spring of 2000, uh, our SEC board approved a policy to waive all tuition and fees for dual enrollment students. So uh, those courses, dual enrollment courses, that are taken at the high school, there are no fees that we charge. The school districts actually, uh, they pick up the textbooks uh, and nothing is charged to the student. Now, we do have some students that want to come over to STC that are still in high school and want to register for classes independently. For those students, we charge a $50, uh, a $50 per credit hour fee. It's not $150. It's actually $50 per credit hour. And um, you know, these are for students that want to come and take classes here uh, at STC. We have, uh, because of this board policy, we've actually served over 67,000 students and we've saved families about 71 million dollars. Now, the, the, what we do is, although we don't charge, for instance, for uh, uh, tuition and fees, what we do is we do charge the school districts, okay? 
So for instance, if, a, if an STC instructor is going to go teach at the high school, we will charge for time and travel, uh, which is about maybe $2,600. And then for the high school dual enrollment faculty that is qualified to teach as an STC faculty that's at the high school, we actually pay them $350 per class per semester, and it's pretty much a stipend. Now, what we do uh, at the institutional level, we can go ahead and uh, receive uh, student contact hour funding for that particular student. So that is what really helps us afford uh, to offer the dual enrollment and the high school as well, because the high school collects on their average daily attendance funding as well. So that's how we're able to uh, continue this program growing and increasing. Oh, very impressive. Yeah, that's that is that is good news. Um, so I know um, Lupe, we asked uh, to if we could meet a, a student from South Texas College, and I think you have a, a video of one of your students to share with us. Yes, yes. Let me share a video. This video is uh, the gentleman that's going to speak here. Uh, is his name is Leo Lopez, and he is a graduate from our uh, second class of the Dual Enrollment Medical Science Academy. So. Um, this, again, will be uh, coming in through speakers. However, if you're not able to uh, hear this, you know, OVA will be recording this webinar as well. So let me see if I can play this. I don't know if I'm able to put this at the moment. It, it, I don't believe it's letting me. I think we might be having some some technical difficulties. Here we're gonna we're gonna see if we can do it on our end, uh, Lupe. Let's see. Okay. Very, very impressive and 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 really uh, inspiring. So um, thank you, Lupe, for sharing uh, sharing some of uh, South Texas's work. And your contact information is on the screen. We have been getting some questions in, so uh, we'll be getting those to you um, um, after the webinar if we if we don't have a chance to discuss them um, before we get sign off here. So now we're going. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mayor.
All right, so now we're going to move north uh, from Texas to Kenosha, Wisconsin, and to Gateway Technical College and learn about some of their pioneering efforts helping adult and dislocated workers obtain new skills and credentials. We're joined by Deborah Davidson, who is the Vice President of Workforce and Economic Development Division at, at Gateway. Deborah, thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much for having us, uh, especially on behalf of the Wisconsin Technical College System. Uh, we're happy to be with you today. I'll give you a brief overview of Gateway. We are located in Kenosha, Wisconsin, halfway between Milwaukee and Chicago. We uh, celebrated our centennial two years ago, so we are 102 years old. We serve three counties in the southeast corner of the state of Wisconsin, about 25,000 students and we uh, were the first publicly funded two-year technical college in the country. So we have, a, we have a long history of working with our local employers, solving some of their hiring needs, and working together to, to come up with some uh, solutions. Great. Thanks for that. And I hope all the snow's off the ground by now. It absolutely is. It's sunny <laughs> and about 72 degrees today, so thank you for asking. <laughs> <laughs> so Gateway Technical College has gotten a lot of people's attention in the last few years for its work building on ramps to education and careers for adults and dislocated workers. Can you share with us some of the programs and practices you've developed over the last, last decade and why you think they're working so well for this group of folks? Absolutely. Uh, one program that I'm going to focus on is our boot camp program. And boot camp seems to be a term that's being used more and more frequently by a number of different uh, colleges and educational institutions across the country. Um, like the Joyce Foundation, back in 2005, we saw that transformation of the workforce. And at that time, we had about 250 uh, CNC machining, computer numerical control machining openings in southeast Wisconsin. And we have a one-year technical diploma program and graduate probably between 15 and 20 students every May. So clearly, we were never going to catch up to those 250 openings we had. So we convened employers and asked them to identify for us the necessary skills for entry-level workers. Um, and we put that together across about 30 different employers, came up with a, a matrix of the skills that they were looking for. And the number one thing they asked us is, can you teach people to show up every day and show up on time? Uh, we said, you know, we, we can preach that. We can teach that as much as any employer can. But perhaps what we need to do is to simulate that work environment and have it as an expectation. So the boot camp, uh, the reason we use that, that name is because of the rigor of the program. Uh, students go through a program that is 15 weeks in duration. They're here five days a week, eight hours a day. Um, and it does simulate that work environment. So we have strict attendance requirements. Uh, it's a three strikes and you're out policy. So if you are tardy or absent, um, you can be fired from the program, even though you're a student in the program. And um, there's also mandatory tutoring. So in any class, if a student is getting less than a grade of B, they stay for mandatory tutoring from 4.30 to 6 p.m. Monday through Thursday or Friday afternoons from 12.30 to 4.30. So it's targeted uh, for dislocated workers uh, because this boot camp program becomes their job for those 15 weeks that they're together. The skills, we've used the boot camp program for CNC machine operators, but we've also transitioned it to other occupations like uh, metal fabricators and welders and machine repair technicians. So to give you an idea for the CNC program, the curriculum includes things like safety, measurement, uh, lean Six Sigma yellow belt, blueprint reading, uh, CNC operation, applied math, and writing skills and reading skills. So that's kind of the basis of the program. And in order to make this happen, we really had to look at our partners throughout the community, uh, employers, our workforce development centers, and Gateway. And what really makes this work is everybody stays true to their mission. So we've put a chart together here, kind of a diagram of what everybody brings to the table. And using this as our template for everything that we do as we uh, put the program together and look at new improvements, we look at whose responsibility should that be. So just to run through this, employers obviously play the biggest role in that they helped us develop the curriculum by, by coming together as focus groups and, and telling us what skills were needed. Once we designed a curriculum, we brought them back in and had them validate it. And we do use some external third-party uh, assessments to validate those skills. They helped us with, with workplace competencies. And then they mentor. Um, the uh, graduate that you're going to hear from in just a moment also comes in and mentors and helps out as a lab assistant in our program. 
And then, obviously, the big way that employers uh, uh, play a part is employment opportunities at the end of the program. So employers come in and help with mock interviews when the students are about two-thirds of the way through their program. And then they come to the completion ceremony, and we set up rooms for them to do interviews immediately following the completion ceremony for the students. So employers are really all in on this program. The Workforce Development Center helps us with some of the employer outreach, and they also do the recruitment. So when we are going to start a boot camp, usually about eight weeks before the start date, the Workforce Development Center announces that application period is open um, and that uh, applications can be picked up at the Workforce Development Center. So they help with the recruitment. They do the pre-assessment. Uh, we require a ninth grade math and reading level, and we also use the WorkKeys National Career Readiness Certification, the NCRC, um, at the bronze level. Um, they help with case management. Many of our students um, have held jobs in the past and, and uh, have good work ethic. There's some individuals who have had challenges, either transportation, child care, or other things that come up in life that affect them when they're going through their training program and will carry through and affect them when they're employed. So the case managers work with them on contingency planning. Who's your support group for child care? What are your other transportation alternatives? And, and keeping them on track. So the case manager is kind of their cheerleader, their sergeant, their coach, um, and, and another person for them to go to with any issues that they may have. And then uh, the job placement part of workforce development, when the students are about three weeks prior to completion, their resumes are put together in a booklet, and that booklet is provided to all employers in the area who have job openings and they're invited to come to the completion ceremony and, and perform interviews. The college uh, stays true to, to our mission. We develop curriculum, uh, instruction, and resources. We have done continuous improvement on almost every boot camp we have, so students end up with an MSSC safety certification, a Lean Six Sigma Yellow Belt certification, and then we use a, a national competency test, which they uh, receive certification for as well the skills validation, and then also the career pathways. And we provide the facility and the faculty for, um, for the program. So some of the statistics, we have run 16 CNC boot camps and have had 228 people complete. Uh, typically, I will tell you that one or two people are not really sure that we're going to hold true to those attendance standards, and they may push the envelope early on and find out that, yes, we really do fire you if you're not uh, if you're not all in the program, uh, I'll get to the reason why when we get to the funding issue. We've had eight welding boot camps and three machine repair boot camps. And the machine repair boot camp actually was developed through a Department of Labor wired grant. We developed the curriculum uh, for Southeast Wisconsin for that. So the real proof of that any program is not how many people went through it or how many offerings we had, but it is what are the results. So here's our boot camp, our post boot camp employment. 87% um, of the people that start the program end the program. And of those, 93% of them are employed. Um, the wage range is there, uh, low, average, and high. That is their starting wage. But we find that many of our graduates, once they um, are in employment for a period of six months, they are moving up that salary scale with their employer. The number one thing that employers like is that through this 15-week program, students have become accustomed to um, discipline, showing up every day, being on time, not having their cell phones out while they're in the lab or in the classroom. So we hold them to really high standards. And uh, you can see the demographics listing there as well. Age ranges everywhere from less than 25 up to people in their 50s. So some are career changers, some are people who already have a bachelor's degree and they're coming back because they're unable to find work and they know that in our boot camp program we have employers lined up and ready to take individuals as soon as they possibly can. Um, and as far as career pathways go, we have laddered these so that uh, in any of the boot camps they can get advanced standing into our uh, diploma or degree program or they can go into apprenticeship program. Wisconsin has a strong history of apprenticeship, and we have aligned the skills that individuals get in the boot camps with the apprenticeship, where it would reduce the number of classroom hours that they would need to spend in apprenticeship. Thanks, Debbie. That's it's really impressive, and uh, that's uh, a rigorous program too. It's hard hard when you know you could get fired from boot camp. 
Exactly. Uh, and actually, right <laughs> now we are we're going through a uh, study of all of our boot camp programs from from day one back in 2005, and taking a look at where are they now. So mm-hmm. how did this boot camp give them the jump start? Did they stay in their first job? If so, did they did they uh, progress in their position? Did they continue on and come back and do more uh, credits towards the program and apprenticeship? So we'll have more of that longitudinal data from you know from the last seven years. Great! Wow. Well, we really look forward to seeing it. I hope you'll share that broadly because that that's going to be important uh, important information. Um, Great. So moving on at. You know, just like uh, with the case with dual enrollment of uh, secondary students, we know that funding these kinds of integrated integrated programs can be very challenging. Can you share with us how you funded these programs over the years and how you've adapted to changing to changes in the funding landscape? Absolutely, uh, adaptation to funding is probably the thing that we do best. Uh, you know, when we put these programs together, we uh, we use some Workforce Investment Act dollars. There have been a number of grants, both state and federal, that we have used, uh, federal financial aid. Some employers have said, I want to sponsor three students going through the boot camp, knowing that I can hire them when they're done. have had a few individuals who said, I- I'll pay for this myself. I just need to get through this program in order to uh, get into the, into the workforce. So we have used anything and everything, and the, the average cost for a boot camp is probably in the uh, $2,800 to $4,000 range, depending on the program. The machine repair program is a little bit longer, so it's a little bit uh, higher cost. And uh, recently, within the last year, SC Johnson, which has its world headquarters in Racine, Wisconsin, um, gave us a donation to run uh, three CNC machine repair boot camps per year two welding boot camps per year, one machine rep- repair boot camp per year, and a couple of healthcare care uh, boot camps uh, over the next two years. So they are uh, investing in the community. It's not that they hire individuals that come out of these boot camps. It is a matter of improving the community and putting people to work. So they are obviously um, a, a great friend of the college. They see the value in the program and getting people back to work. And so we are, you know, for the next for the next year and a half, we are funded through their donation to continue doing boot camps. That's that's an impressive community partner. So we're about to move from the level of the community college up to the state level. And uh, can you, before we do, yeah, can you take a minute though to tell us how you interact with policymakers at the state level in Wisconsin? Who do you talk to, and what do you need uh, from them to be successful at what you do at the community college level? Well, we pretty much talk to anybody and everybody that will listen to us and and hear about our program. We've presented on our boot camp uh, nationally and at the state level for probably the past five years. And so we've become uh, somewhat known, at least in our state. And it does help us that we, uh, when we do completion ceremonies, we invite our elected officials. We want them to know what is going on and what's so different about what's happening at Gateway and, and what our placement rate is for our graduates. We also want them to know that we are open to any and every type of public-private partnership that's possible. So we look for ways to integrate with local employers and say, you know, if we can get employers to the table to do their part, can we get the funding um, from the state in order to offset the additional cost? And we've been really fortunate because we have some local county executives who are very much on board with the work that we're doing. In fact, we're doing a youth boot camp uh, coming up for individuals going into their senior year of high school based on a county executive's um, initiative to get more youth going right into career pathways. So it is uh, it, it is a, a story worth telling, and uh, we tell it frequently. We have our legislative legislators on our campus as much as we possibly can so that they they see it firsthand because as much as you can tell people about it until you meet with the boot camp students and find out the impact it's making in their life, you don't really get the story until you get it at that personal level. Great. Well, speaking of meeting boot camp students, um, I think uh, I think you've, you've got a student for us to meet. Would you be able to introduce him to us? I certainly do. I want to introduce everybody to Mr. Shante Harris. Shantae is a former boot camp student. He completed his boot camp, uh, CNC boot camp, in April of 2012. So it's been just a little over a year. 
and uh, I'm going to hand it over to him, and he can share a little bit about his story and why the boot camp and, and what difference it's made in his life. Okay. Um, I'm, um, I, I had a hard life, and um, I never could really get a good job. I was working this job, and it was going nowhere, and my my supervisor, he looked at me one day. He's like, I've been here 11 years, and I make $10.50, and I, I, that was it. I couldn't do it anymore. So I went to um, workforce, and I signed up for this boot camp. I had to attend a couple classes, and they told me the rules, and I really was kind of interested because they made it hard. They was kind of like on us, like, you got to do this and do this, do this, and um. I, I I I did everything. I, I it was it was hard. It was it was a lot of tests. It was a lot of homework. Everything was fast paced. I never missed a day of class. I never was late. I made the dean's list. I I got to meet all the employers, and I'm a felon, so I was always scared that I wasn't able to get a job. But the boot camp brought the employers to me, and I was able to talk to them instead of just sitting my resume on their desk and it getting thrown away. Um. I, when I graduated, I ended up getting the, one of the best jobs in my my area. Uh, I, my, I ended up, within a year, I got married, I bought a house, we bought a new car, I met the governor, I met the mayor. I get to work with students all the time. I get to meet people, I get to help them change their life because I can relate to some of the things they're going through. My son is proud of me. My family is proud of me. I, I, I have a life. I'm happy. Before the boot camp, I was just walking around waiting. To I had no life. I was waiting to die. I was, and now I'm just. I go to work smiling and singing. I enjoy my life, and I make a difference. I have a whole new group of friends. I couldn't ask for a better situation. And now I'm, I'm gonna get the. I got a. I got a second job. Actually, I got kind of three jobs. <laughs> and my company paid for me to come back to school to further my education, so I can advance further. I I can't get enough. I just got so much to do, and things are happening so fast for me. And I'm on top of the world, <laughs> where I used to sit in the valley and say, "Them some tall mountains." Now I sit and try to figure out how fast. I'm going to get up the mountain. <laughs> so. I, sh I should also mention that Shante has come back and uh, works for us at Gateway and helps out as a lab assistant for CNC boot camps now. So he definitely is uh, paying it forward and helping others that are going through the program who may be looking at some of the same struggles he had and uh, letting them know that he was there not too long ago and he's living proof that you can succeed if you persevere. Wow, that's really impressive. Shante, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. It's so important for us to hear that. This is how we know that these programs really do work, and, and congratulations, on, congratulations on all of these accomplishments. It's very, very impressive. So thanks so much. And thanks to everyone at, at Gateway, and uh, Debbie, Debbie's uh, contact information is up on the slide right now. We have gotten some questions coming in for you, Debbie, so we'll get to what we can at the end, and then what, else, what we can't get to we'll definitely be sending to you so that folks can get answers to those questions. Great. So with thank, that, you. thank you. So with that, we're going to round out our discussion today by pulling back up from the institutional level to the level of state policy and practice. We're very pleased to have Dr. Jay Box with us today. Jay is the Chancellor of the Kentucky Community and Technical College System. And for those, of you, for those of you who've worked in Career Pathways for a while, you know that Kentucky was one of the early innovators in the space, going back to the Breaking Through Initiative, and has been finding ways to systematize and scale many of the successful practices in Career Pathways across all its community colleges. Jay, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you, Mary Alice, it, uh, and I'm honored to be here, and it was just great hearing from South Texas and from Gateway. They're doing some very impressive work in Career Pathways, and, and uh, KCTCS can learn a lot from them. For those of you who don't know much about us, K the Kentucky Community and Technical College System, or KCTCS, was formed in 1998 when the former community college system was removed from the University of Kentucky and merged with the former technical college system that was under the state workforce cabinet. Those 28 independent colleges were consolidated to form 
16 comprehensive community colleges. And during our first 10 years of, of our existence, we were all about expanding access as KCTCS now has a campus location within 30 miles of 95% of the state's population. And our enrollment has grown from 57,000 back in 1998 to over 100,000 in 2012. Great, thank you for that background information, Jay. And I'm wondering now if you could share with us how, from a systems level, you support the development of career pathway programs for, for youth and adults across Kentucky. Sure. Of course, it's, it's all about forming relationships and partnerships. I work closely with the Commissioner of Education, the Commissioner of Workforce Development, and our State Leader of Kentucky Adult Education. Uh, we meet regularly, as do our staffs, and through those meet meetings, we've been able to form several major partnerships that have built career pathways for youth and adults. Uh, one example is our new Career Craze Summer Program that is a partnership with the Kentucky Department of Education, Kentucky Workforce Investment Board, and our 16 colleges. This program will introduce middle school students to career pathways in each of the five major workforce sectors here in Kentucky. We're lucky enough to have as our honorary chairperson, Lieutenant Governor Larry Abramson, and he'll be making uh, visits to each of our 16 colleges during the camps to promote careers in technical fields. Each camp is a week long, it's hands-on program, focusing on a specific industry sector. The camps include visits to local companies and guest speakers from the companies. And one of the added benefits to the camps is that they introduce middle school students to our dual credit programs for high school students. And we believe that's going to be a major uh, advantage for us. Speaking of dual credit, in 2011, KCTCS and, and the Kentucky Department of Education signed a statewide dual credit agreement that standardized our dual credit tuition across the state and placed more emphasis on the quality of dual credit course offerings from our community colleges. We worked closely with the Kentucky Department of Education to assure that we are offering dual credit courses in each of their 16 career clusters and that our courses also meet the needs of high school students individual learning plans, and that the courses are aligned to pathways towards post-secondary education credentials in our five most popular Kentucky industry sectors to assure that, that students are on their way to successful careers. We are also proud of our work with the Kentucky Department of Education on providing support for the internationally recognized Cisco curriculum through our dual credit and support provided by our Cisco Networking Academies. When it comes to working with low-skilled or underprepared adults, KCTCS has partnered with Kentucky Adult Education and the Cabinet for Education and Workforce Development on several initiatives. And most recently, Kentucky has joined the Accelerating Opportunity Initiative, a program based on Washington State's IBEST program that enrolls adult basic edu education students in post-secondary education in career pathways that feature basic skill instruction contextualized to the technical program and team taught by an adult education instructor and technical education faculty member. I would also like to mention that what makes all of this st statewide implementation of career pathways possible is the KCTCS RSVP model, which stands for Responsive Solutions Through Vigorous Planning. Through RSVP, we have system-wide committees at every level, from the presidents down to uh, staff and through statewide faculty curriculum committees. System technical program curriculum committees have recently completed a three-year process where they met with business and industry leaders across the state gapped their programs to align with employer expectations and adjusted all of our stackable credentials that lead to the careers. Stackable credentials are at the heart 
of all of our technical programs. We believe that students should have multiple exit points so that they can obtain credentials that allow them to move directly into employment. The more certificates they stack up, we believe the more employable they are. That's great. Uh, thanks so much, Jay. And, and you know, one of the sig signature features of Career Pathways, which you mentioned, um, are a lot of cross-system partnerships and partnerships with employers. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how that works at your level? Who are your partners, and how do you recruit them? How do you keep them, and how do you coordinate with them? Well, I, I probably mentioned this earlier, but it you know it all starts with building relationships and forming partnerships. Uh, KCTCS is connected with everyone. You know the universities, business and industry, lawmakers, policymakers, etc. Personally. I represent KCTCS at the State Workforce Investment Board meetings, and I meet regularly with the Kentucky Association of Manufacturers, Kentucky Association of Economic Development, and the Kentucky Chamber of Commerce. At the local level, our college presidents, chief academic officers, and directors of workforce training meet with local organizations and business and industry representatives. We also work hard on keeping our business and industry partners engaged and credential obtainment of their employees. Two years ago, we implemented a new initiative called Workforce Transitions to, to assist employees who start with us through workforce training classes to transition to a pathway toward a credential. Since KCTCS colleges award academic credit for approximately 60% of all the incumbent worker training provided through our Workforce Solutions Division, the transition for employees is made easier since they have already built a transcript of credit courses through trainings required by their employer. Credit is aligned to courses that lead to certificates, diplomas, and degrees. KCTCS then works with employers and those individuals to move them into credential-seeking student status and through their career pathways. An example of how this is done is, is recently one of our colleges up in northern Kentucky, Gateway Community and Technical College, not to be confused with Gateway that you heard about earlier. Gateway Community and Technical College has developed career maps for employers based on the jobs in, the, in that organization to align them to career pathways at our college, thus providing employees with a clear direction as to how they can obtain higher level jobs in their organization through educational attainment. That's, that's great. And, and as I mentioned, Kentucky has been the source of a lot of innovation in career pathways programming, and that, uh, that seems to be continuing. We've been hearing about it already this morning. You also recently launched a, an exciting program called Learn on Demand that it's aimed at working adults. Uh, can you tell us about Learn on Demand? Sure, we're real proud of Learn on Demand. Learn on Demand is, is, is a t totally online program that was developed uh, back in 2009, and it's developed to address the needs of the working adult who desired to start or continue their post-secondary education path, but whose life was too busy to attend face-to-face -face classes or even to dedicate 16 weeks to complete the coursework. Learn On Demand allows students to move through their courses in, a, in an accelerated fashion. It features modulized curriculum, learning in bite-sized chunks, usually in three weeks in length. All the courses are competency-based, allowing the student to advance from one module to another as soon as the mastery of the competencies has been demonstrated. Learn On Demand features 24-7 enrollment, the delivery of the coursework, and 24-7 help desk services. To make this more successful for students, we have integrated wraparound student services model that includes online student success coaches, Ad online uh, advising, early alert system, and on-demand tutoring. We currently offer full Associate of Arts and Associate of Science degree through this delivery method, as well as an Associate Implied Science degree in Business Administration, IT, and the Nursing Pathway. 
Additionally, we are rolling out a new, new degree program, Integrated Engineering Technology through Learn On Demand. The IET program was developed through assistance of the National Science Foundation funded Automotive Manufacturing Technical Education Collaboration, or AMTEC, which is a multi-state collaboration of community and technical colleges and most major automotive manufacturers providing ongoing training for automotive technicians and engineers to equip them with the advanced skills they need to have successful careers in a constantly changing and globally competitive workforce. We're really proud of the success of this initiative in that our target audience has been reached. 85% of the students enrolled are working adults 25 years of age and older, and we have a success rate of 88% which we think is uh, very good for online learning. In fact, it's, it's better than our face-to-face -face environment, so we're very pleased with that. Yeah, that's, those are really amazing outcomes, so congratulations on that, and that's, that's exciting to see for an online program. That's great. So, Jay, we have one last question for you, which is, you know, we've got a lot of community colleges on the line, and we're wondering what advice would you give to the colleges about how to develop the partnerships, both at the local level and at the state level, to build the kind of successful career pathway programs that you have in Kentucky? Well, again, I'll, I'll emphasize that it's all about aligning the vision. Uh, we, KCTCS has participated with the Kentucky Workforce Investment Board, uh, the Kentucky Economic Development Cabinet, Kentucky Chamber of Commerce, Kentucky Council on Post-Secondary Education, and the Kentucky Department of Education to align our strategic plans so that our efforts and resources can be shared as much as possible. That is how KCTCS has prioritized our career pathways work. We, we know that we are in the business providing access opportunities for students that lead to success, credential attainment, and meaningful job opportunities. And that can only be accomplished if we align our plans with all the other major players in the state. Our message is straightforward. Develop a vision and share the vision. Incorporate our plan into all areas of our work. Then intentionally plan, develop, and implement the components. It requires a good mix of project and change management. For, for Kentucky, Career Pathways started back in 2002 with a Ford Foundation's Bridges to Opportunity initiative. From there, we have grown to institutionalize the concept of Career Pathways. Uh, we've built on the success of that program. We issued an RFP for colleges to build Career Pathways to encourage them to focus on both new and existing programs to develop pathways with multiple exit points. All of our KCTCS technical programs are developed as career pathways, and then students are advised on the pathway model, which includes skills needed for jobs at multiple exit points along the pathway, and, but we encourage them to continue on the pathway all the way to a degree so as to obtain a high-skilled, high-demand, high-wage job. And in, in closing, you know, I, I want to reemphasize the, the point about early exposure. For, all, for the student, it always starts with early exposure. Students need to know that, that, they, that there are possibilities for high-paying jobs that don't require a bachelor's degree. Middle school summer programs and then high school dual credit programs can give students the exposure they need to make wise higher education educational career choices. All right. Well, thank you so much. That was an excellent, um, I think, some excellent advice, and and from uh, and from uh, a state that's and a chancellor that's doing great work in this area. So thank you. I think that was all very very helpful. Um, so we um, are running out of time, unfortunately. We have gotten quite a few questions in, and we just want everybody to know who's asked a very specific a question question to uh, to some of the presenters that we are going to get you answers to those questions. We have a a more general one that we're going to throw out to to uh, the presenters. Um, about the new GED and uh, how they see that potentially affecting these career pathway pipe, uh, pipeline programs or bridge programs. Does anybody, I don't know if um, Debbie or Lupe, you might have any thoughts if you've been, if you've been, how you've been sort of preparing for this change and whether or not you think that's going to affect your programs at all? For the recovery programs at, at STC, this is 
the recovery program is just another option uh, for students to complete the high school diploma versus the GED and at the same time earn college credit simultaneously towards a career pathway. Now, one of the things that you have to remember with a recovery program is while they're doing this simultaneously, students are enrolled in college credit at no cost because the school district is encumbering all the costs for these students. So while some students maybe may not graduate with their high school diploma in the fall, uh, they can earn their college credit as contract training. In the spring semester, we re-enroll them again so that they can try to pass those credentials for a high school diploma and at the same time, you know, we keep waiving that, that, that dual credit that they're still enrolled in. So it's pretty much, in our area, it's just an option. You know, I guess the students have to weigh in, uh, you know, uh, is either the GED or I can complete my diploma and earn college credit simultaneously without being charged. So. Great, thank you. That was that was very helpful and and uh, and very informative. Um, we do have another question uh, just about the future. This is this is for Whitney, um, and just uh, if you might share with us uh, what you sort of see looking down the looking looking towards the future for career pathways, um, and and what you're hoping to see happen in this arena over the next decade, from a from a funder perspective. Okay, I think we may have, we may have lost Whitney, so we will catch we will we will uh, get that question to her at a at a later time. I think we are going to have to wrap things up now. We've um, we've uh, come to the end of our time, so um, I'm sure we could keep this discussion going for a while, but we have come to the end of our time. So I'd like to turn it over to Assistant Secretary Brenda Dan Messier again for some closing remarks. Thank you very much, Mary Alice. I'll be brief. I just want to say what a fan fascinating and informative webinar this was. All of our panelists highlighted the central role that community colleges play in career pathway systems. All of our presenters were incredibly thorough and insightful. You're all doing fantastic work, and I was really impressed to hear how innovative you are and the partnerships you've developed. I have to say it's also great to hear from students who have participated in these model programs. So let me thank Whitney, Deborah, Guadalupe, and Jay for taking the time to present your important work. And a special thank you to Shante for your inspiring story and for sharing your experiences with this national audience. Make sure you tell your employer that you were showcased on a national webinar sponsored by the United States Department of Education. Thank you also to our large and engaged audience for your thoughtful questions. I'm sorry we ran out of time, but as Mary Alice mentioned to you, we'll make sure you get answers to your questions. Today's event was the third of our 2013 college, Community College Webinar Series, and we will continue our series this summer when we focus on post-secondary CTE issues. We hope you'll all participate, so stay tuned. So now let me just turn it back to Mary Alice and thank her again for moderating the event, and I want to thank our colleague, Matt Valerius, for his leadership in developing our webinar series. Mary Alice? Great. Thank you, Brenda. And again, we greatly appreciate everyone's involvement in, the, uh, in this event and your commitment on these critical issues. Thanks so much to all of the presenters. I know there was a lot of interest out there in the work of, of the panelists on Career Pathways, and it's unfortunate that we couldn't get to everybody's question. If that's the case and your, questions were, your question wasn't answered or if you have a subsequent follow-up question, please, uh, we encourage you to reach out to your peers featured during the event. They have all agreed to field any additional questions you may have via email. You can find their contact information on today's presentation slides, which will be archived on our OVE website, along with the recorded webinar and transcript from today's event. So please check our website, www.ed.gov backslash OVAE, in the coming weeks to access the archived materials. And as Brenda alluded to, our uh, 2013 Community College Webinar Series will continue with a special event this summer that will focus on the findings of a recent OECD study on the strengths and challenges of the U.S. post-secondary career and technical education system. So stay tuned for more details. We'll be sending out more information in the coming weeks along with the registration link. Thank you again, everybody, for all the questions and interest and enthusiasm on this issue, and we look forward to engaging with you in the future. Take good care. Bye-bye. <laughs>